Mr. Chairman, you referred to analysis uh, claiming to compare Trump and Biden fiscal records. I've criticized both presidents for not doing enough to control spending and deficit, but I don't put much talk in a study of Biden's fiscal records that leaves out hundreds of billions of dollars on unlawful student loan giveaways or that stubbornly assumes Democrats' Inflation Enhancing Reconciliation Act is going to reduce deficits despite all the evidence to the contrary. I'm glad that your party is willing to uh, at least uh, moving away from the delusional claim that President Biden's agenda has reduced the deficit, even if the foreign three tenths trillion that they're now pointing to is a serious underestimate of how much Biden has added to the deficit. Uh, Mr. Schwagel, as I said earlier, I'm uh, willing to consider putting certain tax breaks on the chopping block if it is part of a deal to rein in spending and deficits, but taxes on the so-called wealthy alone aren't enough to dig us out of the fiscal hole that we're in. Democrat proposals is to tax the rich either barely make a dent in the deficit or they're designed to sneakily tax a lot more than just the rich. So my question, has CBO analyzed any legislation or determined uh, it would put, uh, and determined it would put the debt on a sustainable course just by increasing taxes on those over the 1%? Hmm. At the top 1%. Uh, no, the CBO has not analyzed any legislation okay. that would do that. If you were to stabilize the debt solely by increasing the tax rate on incomes above 400000 how high would the rate have to be? Uh, um, you know, we haven't done the analysis of how high, but it would have to be a substantial increase on such a narrow, uh, narrow base. Okay. And wouldn't the tax rate required... Uh, have significant behavioral effect and serious negative consequences for the economy? Yes, a, a you know, much higher tax rate like that would have macroeconomic feedbacks that would affect uh, growth and job creation. Uh, recently, the Wall Street Journal published an essay discussing historical examples of fiscal mismanaging contributing to the downfall of once great powers throughout history. Mm -hmm. Historian Neil Ferguson noted how the general rule of history has been that, and I quote him, any great, any great power that spends more on debt service than on defense will not stay great for a long time, very long time, end of quote. According to CBO, we just crossed this fiscal Rubicon. The U.S. will spend more on interest than on defense this year and every year onward. In your view, do rising debt service costs pose a threat to economic stability? And what has historical lessons can you inform our current fiscal situation? Uh, yes, they, they do. And in, in a sense, that's the near-term fiscal risk is the rising interest payments. That, you know, again, it's both higher interest rates and more debt leading to those higher interest payments. And that affects all the other choices that you as policymakers uh, want. If you want more spending on something or, or tax relief on something, the rising interest payments crowd that out and then have effects on the private economy that there's less, uh, you know, fewer resources, resources available for the private sector, less private investment, job creation, and so on. The Constitution gives the power of the purse to Congress, but the current administration has used mm -hmm. rules, regulations, and other executive actions to make major policy changes with uh, unprecedented consequences for the federal budget, and all of this without a single vote of Congress. How have executive actions changed CBO's budget uh, projections since the agency's February 2021 baseline. Um, yes, sir. So we, we track those and those go into the baseline. Um, I'll list a couple of the largest ones, the um, executive actions. And you mentioned student loans. That's a total of about $560 billion, so more than half a trillion dollars in additional uh, outlays um, so far. And then there's 
there's sort of more court cases and, and more announcements. So that's as of, say, two weeks ago. Um, uh, so that's one. The second is the thrifty food plan that redefined the, um, the basket used in the SNAP program. That, that along with higher food prices, uh, led to about 200 to 250 billion dollars of higher costs. There are Medicaid um, executive actions to streamline uh, streamline enrollment. That was about 164 billion. Um, there are others. The EPA's tailpipe rule um, will will have costs as well. In a sense, that interacts with the provisions in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act that subsidize electric vehicles. And the, the tailpipe rule will push consumers toward uh, EVs. There's ACA regulations uh, addressing the, the so-called family glitch, uh, extending subsidies to uh, DACA recipients, um, and, and more. I should mention that some of the administration's actions have reduced the deficit. They, um, they had a rule that changed the payments to Medicare Advantage plans, and that, you know, that, that reduced the deficit. So it's a bit of both, but, um, but as you said, it's mainly on the outlay side. Senator Murray, 